Hello, everyone. Welcome to the September 2012 edition of the Professor Messer A Plus Study Group. This is in the monthly study group. I say it's monthly, although if you go back through our archives, you'll find I didn't do one last month. I took a, a month off. I played hooky because it was the summer. And I thought, well, let me not do one for just a month. But now we're back in the grind of things. Classes have started again. People are back on the website. So I thought, let's keep going. Let's not lose this. I hate that idea of the what they call podcast fade, pod fade, where people will start a podcast and then it just goes away eventually. I don't want this to go away. I'm constantly trying to add new things. And so now we're having one here in September. So it's good to be with you. If you're watching this live, you have chat rooms available to you. I'm looking at both the chat room that we run on justin.tv. It's also at professormesser.com slash live. I'm also looking at the chat room that's at the bottom of the Professor Messer website that is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's always somebody in there. And I've opened up a brand new section on that chat room called Live A Plus Study Group. So I'm watching that one as well. So you can participate not only through the chat, but for the very first time, you can participate by calling me. And I'm going to take live calls. Should somebody dare to call, I will absolutely talk to you live. The number here on the screen in the United States is 724-444-7444. And they will ask you for a call ID when you connect, and that call ID 114746. Now, I realize for this study group that that particular number is a toll number. It being a weekend, maybe you have a weekend plan where you don't have so many minutes that you can use. It Maybe it's free to call long distance on a toll number. If you're outside of the United States, I recognize that doesn't work. This number also doesn't work through services like Google Voice. So that's not so great. But I just found out last night that I can configure this to work through Skype out, which is a Skype to Skype direct call. Unfortunately, that configuration will not be available until next time. But I promise you, I will have Skype up and running so you will be able to call via Skype from anywhere in the world for free directly into this chat line. I'm going to start next week with our Network Plus study group. But that's just something we'll try. If somebody calls, we'll talk to them. If nobody calls, well, I guess we won't talk to them or have anything to do with that piece. But I I think it's a nice idea to to have at least another way that you could talk call in and talk and ask your questions directly. You send me all these questions throughout the month. When you register for this study group, you'll notice that I ask you, what question would you like to have answered? And that's where we get a lot of this materials because a lot of people have questions about these things. So let's talk about CompTIA A plus and what we are doing with that. This study group, by the way, is something that I, I'm able to do because of you. I take my A plus videos. I put them on my website. They're absolutely free. You can watch every single minute of every single training class that I have for absolutely free. All these A plus videos are out there. And if you weren't watching, I wouldn't be able to do this. So thank you very much for that. I also have people that will purchase DVD-ROM and downloadable versions of this to take when they're not on the internet. And so they are great sponsors of what we do here. If you would like to take my videos offline, there's an option for you there as well. And you can go to the website and find out more about that at professormesser.com slash download A+. Well, let's also talk about people that already have their A-plus certification because you do have the ability to get what they call continuing education units for this. Some people like to collect these continuing education units by writing blog articles, writing papers, attending industry events, or attending webcasts like this. And if you are someone who does that, you can accumulate credits that go towards your renewal of the A-plus certification. I put the big long URL there at the top. But if you go to CompTIA, you go to Google and you type CompTIA um, CEU a credit or FAQ. There's frequently asked questions. That's where you can pull this information that talks about those things. So that's one of the reasons you will see that happening. If you are on my site and you are watching this live, then um, you have a video there. Some people are saying the chat that's in the Professor Messer website is not working for them, but you could click the video and go right to Justin TV and even watch it from Justin TV and use the chat that's there as well, or use the chat at the bottom of the Professor Messer page. I'm looking at both of them. So you can have the video up, but also have the chat up that says Live A Plus Study Group at the bottom, and I'm watching it there as well. How long have you been studying for your A plus certification? You can go to vote.rs, vot.rs. It will not shorten the study group. Thankfully, you can go to 
and I'm going to pull it up on my side so that we can all go to that same study group page together and you can vote on this and we can watch what your vote looks like. In fact, some of you have already been there, thankfully. See, we had plenty of time to go <laughs> to go through and look at the study group information. Uh, we have less than a month. Five of you that are on here have been here for less than a month, four from one to three. So between zero and six months, that's the vast majority of who is there. I should make this bigger so you can actually see it on the screen. Let's see if I can do that so you can see the voting ID. Go to vote.rs and go to 975187 as it says there on the screen. And you can see that piece. And so obviously most of you that are here are in the middle of studying and getting ready for this A-plus certification. And I would say generally overall it can take anywhere from three to six months to study for your A-plus certification. So these numbers are not unusual. Sometimes I'll see people that are starting with their A-plus certification and then they will go elsewhere to the A-plus certification. They'll go do something else and they'll come back. So they'll boomerang back into it. So more than a year, that's undoubtedly someone who has well, they started the certification, they started studying, they started doing that piece. And every, uh, you know, once you start looking at that piece, you certainly run into challenges. I've got a family, I've got a job, there's things that are important. And so you go back and forth. So this is great. As we go through the study group today, I will take these numbers and I'll apply it to what we are doing. I'll make sure that those of you that have been studying for up to six months are getting the latest information about what's going on with the A+, because things are changing right now in the A-plus certification. It'll probably be worthwhile for us to actually discuss some of those and find out what's going on with those pieces. And that is because this is one of the, the, the most and most uh, requested questions, the most frequent questions that I had in um, is the exam update information and what's going on with the exam update. So there is, if you go to the CompTIA website and you try to download the objectives, there is a list of objectives for the 22801 and the 22802 exams. These are brand new certification objectives. Those objectives don't match anything that's available for you to take, however. If you try to go and, and take the 800 exam, you're not going to take the 800 exam because it's not even available to you yet. You can't even sit down and take that certification. This is very common for CompTIA to do. They will take the certification information and they'll put it out there early for everyone to look at it. And they won't have the exam actually available yet. So. Don't worry that you can't take the exam. Now, in a, we talked in a previous study group that a number of CompTIA employees have mentioned on, on the internet study, on the internet uh, name services, I think I got it on LinkedIn. They were talking in the news groups and the groups that were there that they expect to have it available in October. That's not an official date. There's no, or at least I haven't seen an official date come from CompTIA yet. But they have said, nah, October is probably about where we're going to be. And since it was a CompTIA employee that said it, I feel pretty good with that date. It's certainly not written in stone. It's not official. But it gives us an idea of when we might be able to expect this. Now, you can still take the 700 series exam until August 31st of next year. You've got almost a year now available to you to study and take the 700 series exam. So if you've been studying for it, you're worried about that exam, um, uh, doing what we would hope for it to do, that exam is one that now you should be able to study for and take regardless. So if you had to take an exam right now, if you had to walk in a room and take that exam, you would need to study for the 700 series because you can't take the 800 yet. The differences between the two are, are pretty, pretty minor. In fact, if you look here, if you go to the free A plus page, freeaplus.com, um, I think I've got either on that page or if you go to the pull down menu on my website and go to the 800 series videos, which I've already started, there's already some 800 series videos there, and top of that page will take you to a link to a video that explains to you what the differences are. Quite honestly, the difference is very, very minor. Uh, there's probably about an 85% overlap. So if you've been studying for the 700 series, you're practically ready to take the 800 series. You just need to study for a few extra things. 
In the chat room, John asked if the 700 series is obsolete next year. Um, it is not obsolete next year. So just because the exam goes away doesn't mean your certification goes away. If you get the certification and you have an A-plus certification sheet that you passed your exam, whether you took the 700 series or 800 series, you get the same certification. So there's no difference in the certification and taking them. Once you have the cert, it's good for three years. Regardless of what happens with the exams, doesn't matter. Your certification is good for three years. So that part's good. So don't worry too much about that piece. Um, the, uh, the new exams, when they come in October, will also be available. You can take either one. You get to choose which one you would like to take. Sometimes an employer will say, I would like you to take the newest exam because it has new things on it. The newest exam has things about iOS. It has things about virtualization. It has things about the Android operating system. There's topics that weren't covered on the exam that was created three and four years ago because those things weren't prominent three and four years ago in the enterprise. Now in the enterprise, everybody's bringing their own device and their Android devices and their iOS devices. And you need to know how to deal with that. So that is part of the new exam. I love when I read online that that A-plus exam is so outdated. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the information on the objectives. That's pretty, pretty relevant to what we are doing in the industry today. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind is that piece. Now, here's what's changed. This 800 series exam is not all simply multiple choice questions. There are undoubtedly going to be multiple choice questions as well. But there's now also going to be new questions that are performance-based. That means the questions aren't going to be simple multiple choice. They're going to want you to do something. At this point, we don't know what those are. We have not seen any performance-based questions yet. But CompTIA has already announced they are rolling this out into their new exams. It will be both uh, it will be in the A+, plus, the Network+, plus, and the Security+, plus exams. So this will be something a little bit different. We don't know if it's drag and drop. We don't know if you're going to be typing at the command line. I'm not sure yet. So we will know soon. As soon as the new exam is out, I'm going to take it. I'm going to see what's different about it. I will report back to you some of the things that I see within the limits of the non-disclosure agreement that you have to have to take. You have to sign electronically at the beginning of that exam. I'm not going to violate the terms of that NDA, but I will absolutely give you an idea of the things you should be ready and expecting on the new A-plus exam with those performance-based questions. That will be very, very interesting for me to see. It's almost like I want to go in and just take all the questions and spend all the time just having a look at those. Uh, just to see what's there. As a reminder, if you'd like to call in today, we have a studio line. You can see the phone number at the bottom is 724-444-7444. And it will ask you for a call ID number, and you'll put in 114746. That's what's there. I'm taking your live calls today. If you want to call in, I will answer those calls. We'll have you here and answering your questions directly. So I would like to also now go through some of the questions that I got before we do that. Any, it, well, let's talk about the this particular piece of this this 22801 and 22802. I'm looking at the chat room, just making sure I cover um, the the 800 series videos. I am creating a uh, series of videos just for the 800 series exam. I've already started them. They are currently in production, and you can find them on my website up at the A plus pull down menu, you can choose the 800 series exams. And as soon as I get more of those in there, I'm going to add uh, that as a default when you click on that A plus piece. You, when you get your A plus certification or your network plus or your security plus, uh, the, one of the questions in the chat rooms, do you need to recertification? Do you need to recertify every three years? You have a few options when it comes to recertification. When you get your certification, it's good for three years. At the end of three years, if you have not done something to renew that certification, it goes away. And at that point, if you wanted to continue to have that certification, once it expires, you would have to take the test all over again. I doubt anyone is going to do that. Um, that is, that's very, very simple to, to have that happen. What I expect most people will be doing is they'll take their A-plus certification and then they'll want to take another certification. They'll want to take their Network Plus or their Security Plus. If you take and you pass your Network Plus and Security Plus, it renews the previous certifications. So if you take your Network Plus, it renews your A Plus. If you take your Security Plus, it renews your Network Plus and your A Plus 
to the date that you pass that certification exam. There are even third party exams you can take that will renew your CompTIA exams. There's Cisco and there's Microsoft certification exams you can take and pass that will also renew your CompTIA exams. All of that is in the renewal FAQ. If you go to your favorite Googly search engine and you type in your CompTIA renewal FAQ, it will list out for you. It'll take you right to the link that will list out for you all of the things that you need to know for that renewal. Be very, very useful to know that piece. Uh, let's see what other questions are in here. The performance-based questions, I'm not sure if they're being added to both the 700 and the 800 series or if they're being added to just the 800 series. Um, I remember looking through the press release that CompTIA did about that, but I don't recall offhand if it's both. So that will be something interesting for me to go back and look at to see, is that something we're going to be doing with that piece? I just don't know. Um, we'll have to wait and see what they're doing with that. Uh, other questions in the chat room. Um, the studio line, for those asking about the phone number, it is a US number. And I apologize for those of you that um, don't want to call a toll number or that are outside the United States. For the next study group and going forward, this will be a Skype call-in number. I tried to get that set up prior to the study group, was not able to, but we will have a Skype number very, very shortly to be able to do that. So if you're going to join us on the Network Plus study group next week, I will absolutely have a Skype out, which is absolutely free from anywhere in the world. So that would be, I'm not sure if Magic Jack will work. There are a number of services like Google Voice that will not call this number either. Um, so it's one of those things that a lot of people might call that number. That service might see that as a spam, and they'll, they'll shut off that number from being accessible from those. So... Um, the question in the chat room, can we rely on CompTIA to get the new certification out by the end of the year? I don't know. You know, they've already said October, and they've already said they want it out by the end of the year in Q3, Q4 timeframe, the fourth quarter of the, of the year. Um, I'm hoping so. Um, that's one of the challenges we have. I do not have a particular release schedule with my videos. My videos are something I'm able to do in my spare time. I put quotes around that one, spare time. It's very hard sometimes to find that time. But I get into the studio on the weekends. Um, I'm during the week, whenever at night, I'm trying to build those videos out. So on the weekend, I can sit in front of a camera and do a bunch of them at one time. So it's difficult because I never know what's going on in my life at any particular time. So uh, I wish I could say, we will absolutely have these videos done on this particular date based on this particular production schedule. Schedule. But unfortunately, I have a full time position, I have a family, and uh, occasionally I have to balance out uh, all of those things together. But as soon as I finish any video uh, or chunks of videos, I put them online immediately. So if you follow me on Twitter, uh, you follow me on Google Plus, and for some, uh, for some of you following on Facebook, it's difficult to announce things on Facebook because I, when I post something to my Facebook page, not everyone on Facebook who has subscribed to me actually sees that. So it's much more reliable for you to go to Twitter and secondarily more reliable to go to Google+. So I apologize that I don't have a formal production schedule. The, the chaos of the universe does not allow me one, but I'm going as fast as I can, I promise you, along those lines. Let's see what other questions have come up. This is a very popular topic. I must have received 20 or so questions just about this. So that was one of the things that, that we did run into. Um, can I describe the hands-on portion of the A-plus exam? Have no idea what it's going to be. So we will see as soon as they release it and I have a chance to take the exam, I will be able to do that. Um, and, uh, and I do have those. If you go to um, um, see, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you follow me on Google+, Plus. I'll make sure that I post when new videos are out there. So you're able to see when those new ones arrive and what's there. Okay, let's go to some of the questions you had about some of the content that is on the A-plus exam. One of these that came through I thought was pretty interesting. On the A-plus exam, as you recall, there is a question uh, about uh, power. There's a question about being able to, to, to understand power and understand cooling, especially the cooling part of it, and being able to know what to expect if you get into a situation where you would like to cool things down. And one of the questions that came through this, uh, this past week is, how's the internal temperature of a computer measured? 
Now, if you know, if you look at either in your BIOS and some versions of BIOS that you might have, and perhaps on third-party software that you bring up, you can see CPU temperature. You can see hard drive temperature. It's right there, and it tells you minimum. It tells you maximum. You can start to see exactly the thermal characteristics of what is inside of your computer. So there's even settings for automatic shutdown. If the temperature gets too high, the system will shut itself down automatically to protect itself, which is not a bad idea, actually. It's a great little feature, especially if it works with the operating system and can gracefully shut things down. Uh, very, very nice feature to have. Inside of your computer are then little sensors, thermometers themselves inside of your computer. And they're actually inside the chips themselves. If you were to look at, for instance, the CPU that we have, um, inside of the CPU is what they call a digital thermal sensor in the Intel world. It's a, it's a set of circuitry that is in the chip case itself. It's not outside of the chip. It's not, it's not a, uh, a sensor that's stuck on your motherboard somewhere that, that is getting the temperature of the air. It's determining what the temperature is inside of the chip case itself. That's a good number to have. You know exactly how hot it is getting inside of that little furnace that you have on side of your machine that's going through all those calculations, that's going through all of that piece that's inside of that. Very, very useful to have that number because that's a good value on probably one of the hottest things inside of your computer is that CPU. So it's good to have that number available. You can see on the screen here, let me move my head out of the way. This is a CPU ID that is here. I've got a link to this that I'll show you in just a moment where you can pop this up on your operating system and see what the temperature is right now. Very, very useful if you're ever planning to do any troubleshooting of your computer and get an understanding of exactly what is there. Also in your computer are hard drives. And inside of your hard drives, there are a number of sensors as well on the inside of the hard drive case. Sometimes you'll pop up your hardware display and it will show you the hard drive temperature. Sometimes it won't. The hard drive may not have a sensor or the software you're using can't interoperate and talk to that sensor. Very unusual for that because those sensors are so standardized uh, and how it's associated. Here's the link to one that I use all the time, HW Monitor from CPU ID. If you go to CPUID.com, and there's a links right on the page for HW Monitor. That is the hardware monitor. You can go see exactly what's going on with those certifications. And a good point in the chat room, if you're doing some experimentation with a motherboard, you're doing some overclocking, you're really pushing the limits. Maybe you're adding new cooling systems into your computer, or you've just cleaned a cooling system. It would be nice to get temperature numbers prior to you cleaning out your computer and get temperature numbers afterwards. And that way you'd be able to tell if cleaning off those fans or adding additional fans to your computer or maybe using a cooling mat for your laptop, did it have an effect? Did it help at all? You'd be able to tell just by looking at those numbers. So very, very, very useful to have that. And they're all inside the chips we use. And if you're interested at all or worried at all about cooling your system, this is an easy way to do it because you don't have to crack open the case. You don't have to stick a thermometer inside of it. Simply pull up some third-party software. Have, have an idea of absolutely what is there. Makes it very, very easy to figure out what's going on with those pieces and understand how you should be working along the lines of cooling your system. It's one of the things I, I try to look at all the time, especially on a laptop. Um, I have a laptop that is in another room. And I was walking through the room, and I heard this, this roaring noise that something was, was making a lot of noise, and the laptop that's sitting on the, the desk is making a horrible sound. Well, it was all of the fans of the laptop had ramped up to full speed. And normally my laptop doesn't make any noise at all, but it was now really rumbling. So underneath the laptop was the intake for the air and I pick it up and there's dust and dirt all over it. I have a picture of this that I'm putting into the new certification video for cooling and troubleshooting your system for the cooling. So uh, it's very easy to take off the back of my laptop. I did that, and of course, it was a mess inside of there of dust and dirt and craziness. Got out my vacuum cleaner, cleaned out inside all of that. And in my case, I did not use compressed air. I try not to use compressed air for environmental reasons. If you have a compression 
uh, system. If you have a compressor where you can take normal air and compress it, that's fine. Take something outside, spray it down. I played a video at the end of one of these where uh, Carrie Holtzman on YouTube took a, a, a leaf blower and blew out one of those. That will be fun to watch later on if you'd like to see that. Um, that is just one of the ways that you can get the air out. But I was inside the building. I didn't want a lot of dust going everywhere. I just used a vacuum cleaner. It's a very small area, very precise. Got it cleaned out, put the backpack on. The temperature numbers dropped dramatically, and the laptop was silent. No noise from the laptop. So very, very nice. The, uh, the dangers of compressed air primarily, uh, the compressed air in a can is primarily environmental, and uh, there are biological problems. People buy compressed air because there are chemicals in there that will mess up your brain if you inhale it. And so, unfortunately, people have abused that uh, physically. And so sometimes you have to show an ID to purchase compressed air out of a can. That's why I recommend getting, if you have a shop, just getting a compressor. Getting the same type of compressor you would use to spray paint, same type of compressor you use to inflate tires, use that kind of compressor. Much, much better to do something like that anyway. So very, very useful. Uh, Don asked in the chat room, hey, a vacuum cleaner inside of a laptop? What about static? Hey, what about what about those pieces? You have to be very careful about that. If you've ever used a a vacuum cleaner, especially one that's like a, a vacuum cleaner that's in a, a garage, one of those shop vacs, if you've ever used those and you go along the floor with their big plastic uh, plastic tubes that they have on the end of it, and you're, you notice there's a lot of static that's being built up because as those things go by, the static charges are, are being built being uh, accumulated on the outside of that plastic. And if you were to touch it or you were to discharge against something metal, that static would jump over to where the, the potential is much less. So it'll jump over there. And you don't want that to happen inside of your computer. So use a, a, um, a vacuum cleaner that has already got some type of anti-static capabilities associated with it, or get a vacuum cleaner that's specifically designed to vacuum out sensitive electronic devices. Be very, very, very careful with those things when you're using it. Static will get onto your chips and fry them very, very quickly. So make sure you don't do that piece at all. So let's go to some other questions. I think I've covered all the ones associated with the, the dust flying everywhere. Uh, static electricity is a problem with electronics in general, not just modern ones. You, uh, you need to watch all of that when it's coming down to that. OK, there are some new topics on the 800 series that I thought I would blend in to this one because it takes some of the things you need to know for the 700 series exam and blends it into the 800 series exam. And it is this question right here, which is, which RAID type uses parity as a recovery method? And I have a list of RAID types there that you can choose. And you can vote at vote.rs. The number is 353648, or pop open your QR code reader. Put it right on your screen with your mobile device. It puts up a very mobile-friendly page that you can go to and use for identifying that. Let me flip over to that page myself. I'm going to change my screen around here so I can see what's going on with that piece. And let's go to the next. I'm going to look at which RAID type uses parity as a recovery. So everybody, no, nothing in the chat room. Don't, uh, oh, is that the shell chat room? Don't put the answer in the chat room. Don't want to do that. Don't look at it. Don't look at the chat room. You don't want to see that piece. Let's flip over and see what most everybody is saying. We've got RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID P. I, I admit RAID P was probably one that probably not the best answer. That didn't fool anybody, clearly. RAID 0 didn't fool anybody. RAID 1. Some folks thought, well, maybe RAID 1. Are they correct? I wish they were. Most everybody got the correct answer, which was RAID 5. RAID 5 is one type of RAID that uses parity as a recovery method. There are other RAID types. There are many, many different RAID types. For your A-plus certification, you need to know RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and a brand new RAID type. Ah, see, if you've been studying for your 700 series exam, you think, oh, RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, I'm good. That's all I need to know. Oh, but no, they've added another RAID type that you need to know about. So we're going to, to learn. We're going to, re we're going to review RAID 0, RAID 1, and RAID 5 
but we are also going to re review the new type as well. I apologize, taking a sip of water there. So let's go back to our presentation and go through these RAID types. I think it'd be interesting to look at this. Of course, this is the similar information you can get from the RAID video. You're going to get uh, a RAID, a brand new RAID video that includes that that's already in pre-production. I hope to record it this weekend. So you're going to see the content of that video before it's even released. So we're going to get some of those new things. The question that came in from Marky was, this RAID 5 thing, there's a lot going on there. What's up with this RAID 5? What is, and, and how does the parity even work? How does that process work for understanding parity as it's written to these RAID 5 drives? So we're going to go through and calculate the process. It's not, it's, a, it's an overview of how this parity works, but you'll be able to see very quickly how that particular piece operates. So I'm going to, to do that piece as well. Let's first talk about RAID 0. RAID 0 is commonly called striping. That's where you might take the blocks of a file. And instead of writing a file to one drive or writing a file to another drive, you end up writing the file, um, blocks of the file. The file split up into little blocks, and those blocks are put onto multiple drives. I'm showing two drives here, but it can be many physical drives that it is spread across. That's one of the things I find that's a, a pretty useful thing to have if you're interested in speed, because this is high performance. This is being able to go through and see RAID 1, RAID 2, RAID 3, RAID 4, RAID 5, or block 5, block 6, block 7, block 8. The RAID 0 spreads that same file across multiple disks. So that's pretty nice. What's nice about this is because you're only writing half of the content that you would normally be write if you've got two disks. If you have three physical drives, you can split the file up effectively into three pieces. You can write it much faster. Writing to disk is one of those things that is important to consider. One of the problems with this, you can kind of see right in the picture, if one of these drives goes away, you've lost, in this case, half of the file or a third of the file, or a quarter of the file, or a fifth of the file, depending on how many drives you have, you lose part of the file. You can't recover it when it comes up to this, this RAID configuration. It's gone. That's it. If you don't have a backup, sorry, no more data for you. So this type of configuration is not one that you would put in if redundancy was important. In the chat room, um, uh, Dreyfus asked, what if you do RAID 0 with SSDs? Think how fast that would be. Your, your bottleneck probably isn't writing anymore, is it? And you're probably right. Your bottleneck at that point is probably the bus of your system because the SSD can write it so fast. You probably won't get the data to the disk in the speed that it would, might be able to write that. So that, that's very, very common to see. SSD, obviously, is the, the uh, type of solid state drives that you see today that are all just memory. There's no moving parts. It's solid state. So there's nothing that could mechanically go wrong with that. So very, very useful to have that. Now, one of the things that you also notice um, is, is this redundancy is a bit of an issue. I would like to be able to have speed but I would like to be redundant. Well, I can only have one of those if I'm in RAID 0. If you need redundancy, you might want to consider RAID 1. RAID 1 is something we call mirroring. And if we look at the blocks of the file that we have, the blocks of the file are duplicated across disks. And in this case, I'm showing two disks, but it could be more than two disks as well. The blocks are, are simply duplicated. Everything on one disk is exactly the same on the other disk. So it's, it's easy to see that piece. Uh, one of the other nice parts about this is, is that I've got the redundancy built in. The problem is that I am duplicating everything. I have exactly the same information. So if I have a, if I need two terabytes of storage, I need to purchase four terabytes of storage. I need to purchase a two terabyte drive and a two terabyte drive that's duplicate or more two terabytes. You could have more than just a single mirror. You can have multiple mirrors. I'm showing a very simple one here, but you're, you're duplicating. You're buying twice as much disk space, managing twice as much disk space, powering and connecting twice as much disk space. So that becomes a bit of a challenge, but your redundancy is fabulous. When you lose a drive, big deal. I got exactly the same data on the other drive, there's no performance hit. There's no uh, loss of data. That makes it very, very simple to be able to have that mirroring there and be able to understand exactly 
what's going on with those pieces. Now, the question we had earlier was about parity. One of the RAID types that does parity is RAID 5. Now, RAID 5 is just one RAID type that does parity. There are many, 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 many RAID types, and many of them use parity. But for the purposes of your A plus certification, you need to know zero, RAID 0, you need to know RAID 1, you need to know RAID 5, and you need to know the one right after this for your 800 series. For your 700 series, you're good right here. You know your RAID 1, you know your RAID 0, you know your RAID 5. In RAID 5, you have this idea of taking a file and putting blocks across a disk, and then at the on the fourth disk, on the, on the extra disk that you might have, doesn't have to be four disks, but it can be more, uh, you can have a parity drive. This parity is often, as I show here, spread across multiple disks for performance and redundancy reasons. But this is very, very useful to be able to see uh, where exactly we're storing this data. So I've got a block, a block, a block, and then I write a parity of all of these other blocks that I've put in. Then I write a block and a block and a block, and I create another parity of those three blocks. Then I've got another three blocks down here. I create a parity, and I create another three blocks, and I've got a parity. So really, the quite, we're going to talk more about how that parity is calculated in a moment. But this is great, because now I'm not having to duplicate disk space. I don't have to have four drives of exactly the same size and using all of that piece. These, these parity blocks are here to be able to recover should I have a problem. So I'm not duplicating files. I'm just taking uh, an ex a parity of the blocks that I'm writing, and I'm sticking them on a drive. Very, very efficient way to still be redundant, but not duplicate every single file that I happen to have. And, and you'll be able to see that as well, because this redundancy now, if I lose a drive, if I lose disk three, boom, goes away. I've lost block one, block two, block three are still there. I don't have to really calculate. My parity disappeared. But what about these other three blocks? Block block 1B, block 2B, and block 3B. Well, that's a, that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Now, I don't have a way to really that parity B that's right in the middle. That's an issue for me. I want to be able to recover that. That parity B can be used to calculate my missing data. And I can now recalculate on the fly the missing data because I have the parity. That's really, that's really quite amazing that I'm able to do that on the fly. That's why when we talk about hardware RAID versus software RAID, the hardware RAID is so much faster. It has its own CPUs. It has its own processing that it does. This is a reason why. If you lose a drive in RAID 5, it's now having to do a lot more calculations to effectively recreate the data that was on that drive, even though the drive's not there. That's the value of parity. That's so nice to have it right there on that piece. So the other RAID type, if you're going to take the 800 series exam, woo, is RAID 1 plus 0. This is a stripe of mirrors. <laughs> so take, take all of those things we've just looked at, and now take them to the next level. We are layering the RAID types one on top of the other. But let's look at this. It's really not so bad. Let's look at these pieces that are here. I have in my pieces here a RAID 1. So I've got RAID 1 that's that's on my machine. And it has on RAID 1 this block 1 and block 1. I've got all these pieces here to look at on this. And I can see across these two blocks that I have uh, is, is duplicated. It's a RAID 1. It's mirrored completely. There's a duplicate of data on both of these. Then I have another pair of disks where it's duplicated. Those are duplicated. Block 2 and Block 2 are completely the same. And then another set of disks that are duplicated, Block 3 and Block 3. Now, if these weren't duplicated, this would look like RAID 0. Block 1, Block 2, Block 3, Block 4, Block 5, Block 6. It's like a RAID 0. But I've now duplicated the, the, the stripes that I have here. I've mirrored the stripes. And because I've done that, now, if notice the RAID 1 plus 0 at the top, all of those are RAID 0 together. So I'm, I'm combining the value, the speed of having that striping that's there. But now I've got the redundancy of mirroring. So very, very useful to have that. It's the best of both worlds. I've got speed that I can write to all these disks. These are usually done with independent controllers. It doesn't have to be, but that speeds it up just a little bit there. Yeah, notice because it's RAID 1 and it's RAID 0, as Don says in the chat room, there's no parity on this. Yeah, RAID 0 doesn't have parity. 
Grade one doesn't have parity. So there's no parity in association with those things. So very, very useful to have that in place and be able to see that piece of it. Um, you're going to need at least four drives to do this. You can use more than that. But uh, very, very useful. You'll see this, as, uh, as BJ says in the chat room, some uh, uh, books and some resources write this as RAID 10. Well, it's not RAID 10. It's RAID 1 plus 0 is what that refers to. And the CompTIA exam objectives refer to it as RAID 1 plus 0. Some of them, I think, might even say RAID 10 either way. But uh, the idea is that you would be able to have the redundancy of a mirror and combine it with the speed of a stream. So the real question I have for you, now that we have understand the RAID 0, the RAID 1, the RAID 5, and the RAID 1 plus 0, let's go back and talk about parity. Because there were even questions in the chat room about parity. What is that parity? There is no RAID P. That was a... Uh, that was something I threw into the, the questions that came through just to fool you. There's no such thing as RAID P. One of the things that uh, you will notice also in the chat room is this is not really a new type of RAID. It's new to us because it's not been on the A plus before. This RAID type's been around for a while. So it's not something that you have to worry about. If you had a bunch of disks and you wanted to write parity out to them, RAID uses something, generally it uses something called exclusive OR. And you'll see this written as XOR. It's also called even parity. And we'll see why in just a moment. And what that really means is you have one or the other or not both. If you were trying to create a parity, let's say you had two numbers. Let's say you had a 0 and a 0. And you wanted to create a parity bit. For those 0 and 0, the parity would be 0. If you had a 0 and a 1, the parity bit would be 1. Be one or the other, not both, that would be one. If you had a one or a zero, which is effectively the same thing, that would be one. If you had a one and a one, the parity would be zero. So these are the rules you would follow if you were going to write parity to a disk. So let's write our own parity. Let's do this on these disks right now. You don't need to know how to do this for your A plus exam. This is going a little bit deeper than what you would need to know to calculate for A plus. So if you're taking notes to sit back, you don't have to know how to do this, but some one of the questions that came in was, how do I? How does it calculate parity? How does that work? Let's have a look at this. I think once you understand this, it helps understand RAID 5 a lot better. So let's look at this first line of disks. I have a 0 and a 0. Well, and a 0 and a 0, that's 0. So the result of that 0, 0 and 1 is 1. Therefore, my parity of that disk should be a 1, and it is. So let's do another calculation. 1 and 0. 1 and 0. Let's see. Looking at our chart, that's a 1. All right. 1 and 0. The result of that in 0, well, the same calculation is a 1. So the number there should be a 1. And it is. Now, I mentioned earlier this is even parity. Makes it very, very easy to follow when there's four disks here. You effectively have the same number of 1s as you have zeros. So if we were just using that particular formula, 1 and 1 is 0, 0 and 1 is 1. That should simply be another 1 that's there. And 1, 0, 1, what I'm missing is a 0. The 0 goes in there. I just create a parity. That's it. That's the process that's used on a RAID disk. Now, they're doing them probably 8 bits at a time and calculating the parity. It's a little more complex to do it with more than one set of bits. But it's the same process. You just follow all 8 bits down and do that calculation. You do the XOR calculation on that piece. And I did, uh, and that's one of the things that you find if you're now lost a drive, if all you had was your disk 0 and you had your disk 1 and now you had your parity, now you can perform the same calculation to come up with the bits that you're missing. And you simply fill in those bits, performing exactly the same calculation. That's how we're able to keep running on RAID 5 when we lose a drive, is it recalculates the parity or the missing data associated with the parity on the fly. Very, very useful to have that there. That's one of the things that I find is uh, is remarkable about this, is that there is such a, a, a common way to see what's going on with those pieces. And it's exactly the same way every time. It comes in handy when you're trying to get a feel for exactly how to go through the process of calculating and understanding this. Once you now understand how parity works, RAID 5 makes a lot more sense now. Very, very easy to get a feel for that. Let's now move to this month's acronym, TMA. This month's acronym, I don't have, I don't think I have uh, 
a vote.rs for this, but I'm going to to pull up and show you for this month's acronym. One of the things that we are we're doing here is every month I'm trying to give you an acronym that you can use to be able to learn more about different technologies. And one that is on the certification for A+, but perhaps is one that you do not have um, so much, you, don't, you just don't see it because it goes by behind the scenes. It's very invisible is, I'm gonna show you this one right here. If I can pull it up on my screen, I'm gonna make a modification to my slide so everybody can even vote on this, on these pieces. Let's do that. Let's do exactly that. I want to be sure I get the right voting number for everyone. Let's do this. I love making these modifications on the fly. Let's show it to you. This modification. What's DHCP? There's our, our view of this is DHCP. You can vote to determine what DHCP is at vote.rs at 865-575. And let's flip over to that and see what DHCP might be. I've got on my screen what is DHCP. Is, an, is it an automatic method of network addressing? It is, a, is it a storage media file system? It is, is it a memory transfer protocol or is it a blogging engine? DHCP, that is your acronym of the month. I'll give you a moment. It looks like... 11-12 is winning. All right, please don't answer in the chat room, although it's way too late for that, isn't it? Don't want to do that piece. This is one that you run into quite a bit, and it happens behind the scenes. Doesn't look, I, doesn't look like I really fooled anybody with this one. One of the things you do see. I'm going to let a few more people vote on that. Looks like everybody got this one. Nobody was fooled with DHCP in this piece. You can see the method of automatic addressing seems to be the big winner with this one. Pretty, pretty simple to, to see that piece and what it's doing. Let's flip back over to this and get more information about what this is, because it's Rhonda that asked the question this month of what does DHCP stand for? What's the process? You know, it's one of those things you don't even notice is happening behind the scenes, but there it is. You just plug your computer in, you get an IP address. It's pretty simple. They're pretty easy to do something like that. Well, let's have a look at the process. You don't have to know the details of this process for the A-plus exam, but I thought I'd go into more detail with these study groups. I thought it'd be good to give you more information of what's happening behind the scenes so that you can then apply it to what's happening with A+. For your Network Plus certification, you have to know all of this. But for A+, you just have to understand that DHCP automatically assigns me an IP address. But here's what's really happening behind the scenes. There's a first step for DHCP whenever you're working where your client workstation sends out a broadcast over a particular UDP port number, UDP port 67, and just sends it out to everybody and says, hey, is anybody out there that's a DHCP server? Broadcast goes everywhere. And if there is a DHCP server out there, it will communicate back with what, what we call a DHCP offer saying, oh, sure. Now, at this point, the DHCP servers have no idea where you are because you don't have an IP address. Hey, they can't even talk to you yet. So you sent them a broadcast, they're going to send back a broadcast. So everybody on the network gets to see this. That's one of the challenges we have with broadcasts on the network. But here's an example where broadcasts are really useful is that those DHCP servers can send back to everybody, oh, sure, I got an IP address for you. How about this one? And if there's more than one DHCP server, you can do that as well. The workstation looks at all the offers it gets and says, well, great, I'd like to take one of these. And it sends a message back again through a broadcast that says, hey, if this is you and here's the ID just for you, I would like that IP address, please. Can you give that to me? And the DHCP server says, well, certainly, here's an IP address for you. I'm going to take it out of my list so I don't give it to anybody else, and I'm going to give it to you. And there's the acknowledgement. Every time you plug in, it does this. It's a broadcast every single time it goes through this process of broadcasting those, at least those four steps, every time you do DHCP. 
Now, one of the things that a uh, question in the chat room was, does that broadcast go through a router? Because we've got a lot of routers. Our networks are usually separated by routers. Our subnets are separated by routers. Our VLANs are separated by routers. And does that mean we have to have a separate DHCP server on every single subnet? And you'll notice in this picture, I put a picture of a router. And that broadcast went right through that router. And if you watch my videos, you get to say, I call shenanigans because I know broadcasts do not traverse routers. Aha, I caught you. Professor Messer, you're wrong. But interestingly enough, in every other case, you're absolutely correct. Broadcasts do not go through a router. But DHCP is special. DHCP is one where it's automatic and every single computer on our network needs to be able to work with DHCP. Nobody in an enterprise environment is statically assigning IP addresses to every workstation. Every major and minor organization in the world is using DHCP. So the problem is that you don't want to have to put DHCP servers on every single subnet. That could be thousands of subnets in a large enterprise. You do not want to go through that hassle. You want to put up two, maybe three, maybe four DHCP servers if it's a really big organization that's going to handle the process. So there is a capability in practically every modern router or every modern layer three device where you can configure this device into something called a DHCP helper or a DHCP broadcast forwarder. There are a lot of different names for this, but it is a special configuration of the router that you go into and say, I know you're layer three and all, but just for DHCP, go ahead and send that broadcast through, won't you? And let's stick some information in there so I know what subnet that came from, because that's going to be useful when I take IP addresses. So that becomes very, very useful. The, uh, the roles that these DHCP servers take are generally distributed as well. Many times they'll have separate subnets that they will manage. And so seeing that role that comes in and communication between them is very important. And most advanced DHCP servers communicate with each other to keep synchronized as well. Most of the time uh, in, a, in a Windows environment, I'll say most of the time, this isn't every time, but you can just simply use your DHCP management built into your Active Directory server or a Windows server itself and be able to do that. But behind the scenes, it's a lot of detail. I know I gave you, you don't have to know all that detail for your certification exam. But it is useful to know that all of those things are happening behind the scenes. You just plug your computer in, you get an IP address. All of this was really going on back and forth. So if you're trying to troubleshoot the fact that you didn't get one of your internal IP addresses, it's probably because it didn't talk to a DHCP server. And now you can begin the process of troubleshooting that and understanding why is my broadcast not making it to the DHCP server? Why is the broadcast from the DHCP server not getting back to me? and start troubleshooting all of those pieces. And that is DHCP. For your Network Plus folks, you'll need to understand all four of the processes for that uh, DHCP. For your uh, the folks that are doing um, uh, the A+, plus, you don't have to worry about the details of that process. John asks in the chat room, so DHCP, I'm doing that at home. I've got a home router. I've got a home computers. I'm, I don't have a Windows Active Directory. I don't have a server set up anywhere for this. So in almost every case, including my case here in the studio, I've got a, a router that's set up out to the internet. And that particular device has DHCP servers built into it. Very, very nice to be able to see that piece associated with it. Um, the Most of those devices that are in our home offices and our homes themselves, those the Linksys, the Netgear, the D-Link, those devices are DHCP servers. They are routers. They NAT. They probably have a wireless access point inside of them. There are switches. They do a lot of things. They got a lot going on. So it's one of those things that uh, that one device has the ability to do so much. And it also acts as a DHCP server. And as Don mentions in the chat room, if you were to look at ipconfig slash all, could you try to ping the DHCP? Except you don't have addressing yet to know where the DHCP server is, and you don't have an IP address you can use to ping with. So it's a chicken and egg kind of thing. You've got now, I don't have an IP address, so I can't ping anything. Becomes a little bit of a problem, doesn't it? At that point, 
you're having to understand, do I have a network link at all? Does that network link reliably connect to, does it reliably communicate out to my router? At that point, you're probably capturing packets. You're pulling up Wireshark, you're pulling up a, a packet capture device, and you're trying to get more understanding about it. Very, very hard to troubleshoot IP-wise from a machine that doesn't have an IP address yet. Bit of a challenge. So that is DHCP. Let's go. Uh, let me also mention at this point, I haven't been taking calls yet. I've been flipping over to the line. I missed a couple people that have gotten there and they've hung up already. But if you call into this line, I can take your questions live at 724-444-7444, right at the bottom of the screen. Your ID number there is 114746. I am checking in every now and then to see that. So if you'd like to, you're welcome to. If you don't, no, no worries. I've got plenty of questions from you to go through. Not even a concern. One of the questions that came through this week was, what is the best study guide book someone should purchase to prepare for the test? This is Kiki that asked. Um, best is a objective term. Uh, it's one that everybody has their best. Everybody thinks about their best one. I have one that I like. And the one that I like is from a company called GTS Learning. These are folks that I've worked with for well over a year now. Um, if you go out to professormesser.com slash freestyle or professormesser.com slash exam practice, they even have exam practice tests as well. Freestyle is an all-in-one system. It's a book. It's videos. It's exams. It's everything in one place, and it's all online. I don't have to carry around a book. They do have books at GTS Learning. They've just taken the entire book, and they just stuck it online. What could be easier than that? It's one of the, the nice things, and they've taken my videos, and they've put them in the book. I'm going to flip over and give you a fear for what this looks like. If we were to go to GTS Learning, I'm going to log in with my credentials on Freestyle to give you a feel for what this looks like. I have a lot of courses on mine. They've enabled a bunch of courses on my side, but I'm just going to show you the N10005, the Network Plus course they have. They have A+, plus, they have Security+, Plus, they have Network+, Plus, they have a lot of that are there. But what I like about it is they've got a prerequisite test right at the beginning. You can take an exam on A+, plus or Network+, plus and attempt the quiz. Let me go through the quiz. It's the same kind of structure and format that you might see on a real exam. Because you answer the questions, you can mark them for later, you can flag them, and then go back to them. The same type of process that you would really do right when you're working with the exam. Let me pull my face up so you can see that. Uh, another thing they have in here, I'm going to back up a bit, is the book itself. So you can go into the book. Let's do DHCP, for instance. We were just talking about that. Notice the book is in here, but also my videos are embedded right in the middle. So you can read the book and go through the details of what DHCP and Boot P are. Here's the details of how all of these things work, and there's the video that addresses it. So if you wanted to read a little bit, and instead of fumbling around and trying to figure out where the video is for this, it's right in the middle. So it's very, very simple to step through everything you need to know all on one page. And they also have post exams. You have exams you can take after this particular section is done, take a summary exam. And then at the end of this, they have some sample exams you can take as well. Uh, a great view of this, um, they've got a number of specials set up. They have free trials that you can use. Again, you can go out to uh, professormesser.com slash freestyle or professormesser.com slash exam practice if exams are just the thing that you would like to see. Maybe you already have a book. You would just like some Q&A. They're a great sponsor of what we do here at Professor Messer. And I like to mention that on our study groups because they're a great sponsor of the study group as well. Make sure you take advantage of that at professormesser.com slash exam practice. And we thank GTS Learning for being a sponsor of those things. Very, very nice to have them there as well. Let's talk about some of the questions you sent in for us and how the test has changed, what you should do to study. Uh, these are a little bit of a challenge as well. In fact, this is one I get quite a bit. Mary sent this in. I'm taking the exam in two days. Any last minute advice? What can I do? What, what should I be doing last minute? If you're down to the wire and you want to be sure you've covered all of the bases, what are the things that you can do? The chat room says, the, find your favorite deity and begin, <laughs> begin praying. There are some practical things you can do as well. Let's go to, in fact, the CompTIA website. I'm just going to pull up CompTIA.org and look at this. There's a section here for certifications. 
I'm just going to click on certifications, which takes you to actually another website, which is certification.comptia.org. And there's a section in here for A+. And this is all the details of the A-plus exam. Make sure you're familiar with the A-plus exam, that it is the A-plus essentials and practical application. There are 100 questions on the exam, 90 minutes each. There's the passing score you have to have. That's useful. Well, the reason I came to this website, though, is I wanted you to see that on this page, I'm going to scroll back up a bit, see what the exam covers is on the right side in this little blue section. Let me zoom up a little so we can really see this. It's on the right side. See what the exam covers right there. And I'm going to click that. And it's taking me to a page where I fill in downloading the ex exam objectives. That is very, very important. Um, this is one of those things that, um, that m I find people don't even know is there. CompTIA tells you exactly what's going to be on the exam, down to very, very specific levels. I'm going to pull up. I've already downloaded my exam objectives list. So I'm going to pull up my list and put that on here. I think I've got one right here for the 701. Realize you can't see this yet. I'll flip over in just a second. So here, if I bring back my camera so you can see this piece, one moment. Here you go. So here's my exam objectives list. These exam objectives are just a PDF document. That's all it is. What's nice about this list is they tell you exactly what's going to be on the exam down to the detail. Here's the hardware section. Categorized storage devices and backup media, floppy drives, hard drives, solid state versus magnetic, optical drives, removable drives. You know exactly what you should be studying. I'm going to scroll down a little further just so you get a feel for this. Uh, compare and contrast memory types, characteristics, and their purpose. Understand dynamic RAM, static RAM. Uh, you've got synchronous dynamic RAM, DDR, DDR2, DDR3, RAM bus. You have to know all these things. This is a great checklist. If you've got two days left before your exam, make sure you get the, this objectives and go through each one of these. Check them off. You know, print it out on a sheet of paper and just check that piece. And uh, somebody in the chat room says, you say this all the time. Every study group, you say this. I say it every time because I get questions all the time about what's on the exam. I don't even know. What, what should I study for in the last two days? This is what you should study. It's remarkable how many people I ask, well, have you downloaded the exam objectives? And they go, what are those? I don't, I don't know. How can you take the exam and not know what's on it? If you haven't done this yet, do that. And I do say it every time. So if you've been on many of my study groups, I apologize. You've heard it over and over and over again. If people would stop asking me, I would stop telling you. But they haven't stopped asking me yet. So I apologize for those of you that have heard it before. But boy, it's really, really important to make sure you know exactly what you're going to run into. And if you don't check a section, you know you need to study that. So it's a good sanity check as well. It's exactly what I do before I go in and study my pieces as well. Another question, would you suggest waiting for the 802 exam? Or would you like, should we just continue with the studying for the 701 exam? Adam asks this one. And this is another good question, which is, um, there's, there's two exams now. Ugh, which one do I take? Well, if you need it to, right now, you had to take the exam right now. Your boss says, you got a week. Go take it. You got to pass it. You don't have a choice. The 800 series exam, it's really the 801, 802 exam, are not available yet. The 701, 702 are available. That's the one you would take. You've got a year to take the 701, 702. And quite honestly, if you study the information in the 701, 702, and later on you think, I might want to take the 800 series, there's an 85% overlap in data. The information you're studying is not wasted. In fact, if you know you're going to take the 800 series because you're not going to take it until next year, but you'd like to study now and all you have is the 700 series, just don't watch the or study the Windows 2000 stuff because Windows 2000 is not included on the 800 series. Go to my 800 series exam video page. There's a link there for the video that says, show me what's different. And now you know exactly what to study between those two. Very, very useful to have that capability there. Um, make sure you pick the right one. And as I mentioned earlier, some employers say, I want you to take the latest exam, the newest exam. So they may tell you they want you to take the 800. When you get the certification, they look exactly the same. 
you won't be able to look at your sheet on your certification and see which one you passed. It just says A+, because it's the same, same certification. It's the A-plus exam. Very, very simple. In the chat room, they asked, which, okay, which one's easier? Aha, you're looking for a way to get the, the easiest way to get the certification. Um, I guess it's, it's really up to you. Um, both are, as I mentioned, 85% overlap. I don't really think one is easier than the other. Although if you think about it, the 700 series exam has Windows 2000 content on it. Unless you've been around for a while, you probably haven't touched Windows 2000 in a while. Now, I will say, I'm on a lot of planes every week. I'm flying all over the place. I still see people running Windows 2000 on laptops. I swear I'm seeing this. It, it shocks me every time. And I make a note. Yep, I can still see. You know, people say Windows 2000 is on the A-plus exam. That's silly. No, it isn't. There are large enterprises that move very, very slowly that are still using Windows 2000. And there are some, uh, some uh, people I know in their data center that's still using Windows 2000. It's, it's still being used because in these really, really big environments, they put up this big complex system and then it sits there and it becomes a part of the organization. It's running a really important application and then it sits there and it sits there and it's, nobody wants to touch it, it's working. Would you wanna to touch something that's working? No, and it's working fine. There's no reason to bother it. So sometimes it makes good business sense to run those older operating systems. Now, obviously, there are security issues with Windows 2000. They're not doing updates for Windows 2000. Most people are updating those things. And I'm sure eventually you'll see some of those things go away. But, uh, but if you're studying for your 800 series, Windows 2000 is not on it, along with some other topics as well. Make sure you watch the video and look at the specifics between those. Our next question, can I still pass the 2012 CompTIA exam based on what's on the older videos? Well, that's a pretty good question. If I was going to try to get my certification, this new one I'm assuming you're referring to on the, the 2012 CompTIA exam, that's the 800 series. Um, you obviously can't pass it yet because it's not available, but when it is available, I think you can get 85 to 90% of the content, as I mentioned, from the 700 series exam. You're not going to have some of the newer technologies on there. You're going to be studying some things that aren't on the 800 series exam, like Windows 2000, like serial ports, like some of those older style technologies. Virtualization, not on the 700 series. Uh, iOS and Android portable devices, not on the 700 series. So things like that you'll miss. So you still have to study some 800 series specific topics. I would not recommend at all reading and studying for the 700 series exam and walking in and taking the 800 series. Not a good idea, especially when the 700 series is still available. If you study for the 700, take the 700. If you study for the 800, take the 800. But don't think you can walk into the 800 series exam and do extremely well. You want every possible advantage when you walk into that exam. The chat room, they're talking about operating systems. I've got them all stirred up a bit and looking at those operating systems and what we're doing with those. And it's true that, uh, that when you look at an operating system, like Windows 7 is currently on the a exam, but as we all know, uh, Windows 8 uh, is uh, the release is imminent. And so Windows 8 will certainly be one that will begin rolling out. It's not part of the exam yet. Well, it can't be. It's not even on the street yet. It's not available yet. So don't worry so much about the things you don't have control over. And quite honestly, Windows 8, as they mentioned in the chat room, very similar to Windows 7 under the surface. The front end, very different, obviously, but under the surface, it's not. We're getting near the end of the, of the, um, the formal part of this piece. But if you'd like to call in with an A-plus related question, you can call into our studio line that I have there on the screen. I've also got some links to show you before we're done. If you have non-A-plus related questions, I'll be glad to take your calls after the stream has, has ended. After I start recording, I'll still leave the stream up. But after we finish the study group part of it, we can do that as well. Why not? So let's go to what I like to call our link of the moment. Every once in a while when I'm I'm going around and I'm I'm looking at different websites, I find something really interesting. Sometimes I'll tweet it out, sometimes I'll send it on a Google Plus. 
Uh, but sometimes I save it because it's a good one. I want to put it in our study group. And this one is the 101 most useful websites of 2012, I guess, so far. You know, because we're not quite done yet. I don't know if we realize this. We're not done with 2012. But this was such a good list. If we go to bit.ly slash useful dash websites dash 2012, bit.ly, I've just got a small link there. You'll know when you bring it up why I did useful dash websites dash 2012. And let me show you what this looks like. I don't even think I have it loaded up in my browser. So let's do exactly that. This has a bunch of great websites on there, some that can really help you with your A-plus certification. Right at the top is ScreenR.com. You can record movies of your desktop and send them straight to YouTube. Really, really useful to do things like that. Some other ones that are in here are ones that might also help with professionally the things that you do all the time, maybe not specifically relating to the A-plus exam. Uh, let's see if I can find the one I was thinking of. There's so many here to go through, I think it was at the bottom, blah, 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 blah. Where is it? Some of these are aviary.com I have used before as both an audio. I think they have some graphics editors in there as well. And I've got, I think it's near the bottom was one, notes.io. I don't even think, is, is notes.io even there anymore? I'm thinking of drop.io. Drop.io is no longer there. Notes.io obviously still there. Minutes.io. Very useful. Capture notes during meetings. Just all kinds of little things you run into that maybe you had no idea was out there in the the, the universe of the internet. Uh, one that I use all the time is this one. Show you this one. Down for everyone or just me. So if you're trying to figure out, you can't get to a website, and you're trying to determine on the internet, is it just me? Am I the only one having problems with it? You can type in professormesser.com and say, nope, it's up. It's just you. If you're not getting to Professor Messer, it's because of you. It's not because of me. Very happy to say that. Been very good about uptime on my website lately, so I'm very proud of that piece. So that's a really good one. 101 most useful websites. Uh, and I'll bring that slide up so you can see it. It's bit.ly. I made you the shortcut. bit.ly slash useful dash websites dash 2012. Boy, for somebody trying to make a short URL, I really did a, a bang up job, didn't I? I'm going to make you type for that short URL, but a really useful one, bit.ly slash useful dash websites slash 2012. And I think that's that's one that, uh, that I'm now going to take a lot of links from that and make use of those pieces as well. I think that can come in handy for some of the things that I'm doing. Well, we have, we have gone over our one hour of usually doing things like this, and we are we are well into uh, an hour, almost an hour and a half. So let me finish up by first telling you, of course, that if you'd like to see what we're doing, I do put a daily pop quiz on Facebook. One of the challenges I mentioned with Facebook is that if you follow me on Facebook, you are not guaranteed to see every post I put there. That's by design on Facebook side. They want people like me to buy advertising that will guarantee that all 18,000 of the people that follow me will see that. So unfortunately, only 3,000 maybe 4,000 people will see that, unfortunately. It's just one of the realities of the Facebook world. If you want to be sure to get my daily pop quiz for A-plus every day, get a Twitter account. Twitter accounts are great. You don't have to post. There are so many informational resources on Twitter. If you're not taking advantage of Twitter and you're a, you're a technology professional, you're missing out. Just for breaking news, just to follow some of the uh, the trade magazines and online IT computing trade sites and getting news daily of what's going on, incredibly valuable. And of course, you know, track your favorite celebrities and see what nonsense they're doing these days. You never have to post if you don't want to. And I don't have on here my Google Plus line. Why are we even got to put that? So here we are on the fly. HTTP www.professormesser.com. Google Plus. I think just Google Plus works. So you can go there. I think I've also got Google Plus with a plus. I think I've also got uh, G Plus. I've got a couple of things you can try. So Google Plus is a great resource if you're on Google Plus. And I'm posting the pop quiz there every day now as well. That's something pretty new. So very, very useful to have that. I should do another stream where I'm just talking about Twitter. There's people in the, in the chat room going, what, what Twitter? Which one should I follow? Which one is that? Uh, we'll talk about that maybe when we're done here. I'll have to do a posting on that or list out some of my 
uh, my follows that I do. So you can see that. Again, GTS Learning, a great sponsor of what we do here at professormesser.com slash exam practice or slash freestyle. You'll be able to see those pieces. And we're doing another set of study groups in October. See, we've got an A plus that we do. Next week, I do the September Network Plus study group, but I'd like to do one of these at least every month. And if you'd like to keep track of what we're doing along those lines, you can visit professormesser.com slash calendar, and you'll be updated with all of those pieces. I think that's one of the things that, uh, that I like to do is make sure I try to keep that updated. Sometimes it's not as updated as I'd like. So you can send me a message that's saying, hey, update that. What are you waiting on? Please get that going, will you? We could use some uh, some new study groups, and sometimes that jogs me into getting this process started because I, I put that out there. I have to modify the invitations. I have to modify some of the automated processes behind the scenes, a lot of the links that give you the links back to the timestamps. It's a, it's a little bit of work to get that done, but I think it's, it's well worth it. And of course, I couldn't do this without your help. You're the ones that are really helping me through and giving me the questions every time on something like this. I really appreciate you participating. I appreciate you attending. The chat room was fantastic. You've always got good questions. And uh, at any time, you're always welcome to go to professormesser.com. At the top of the page is a contact us. What that really is is contact me, and your message hits my phone immediately. I can see everything, and I can communicate back to you very, very easily that way. Don't be a stranger. Thanks for joining us this month on the Professor Messer A-plus study group.